The last time I showed you an amplifier, it was a Class A, very simplistic one, but very easy to implement. The one I'm about to show you takes a lot more work, but actually functions in a proper way. It's for real-world use rather than quick testing. The other amplifier is still great for a quick test of a speaker or some sort of circuit, but this one is more of a you'll actually find somebody making one circuit. So the different classes of amplifiers just mean how much of the signal is actually in the output. So your input signal is your sine wave, your audio waveform, or whatever. If the amplifier's output includes the entire waveform unaltered other than amplitude, then it is a Class A amplifier. We'll go into the other classes later. But basically, Class A is known for high power consumption, and it's known for extreme fidelity, because you don't have to do shenanigans to reconstitute the wave. It's all still there. So it's the kind of filter you'll find in one of the stages of a very high-quality home stereo system, for example example, that you can plug into the wall and it can take as much power as it wants and it's more expensive so it can use the power transistors and everything. Now, I've spent a week and a little more trying to understand this. It's not that the circuit itself is complex, it's more that people on the internet are not good at explaining things. And I suppose neither am I. We all explain in our own way. But I find there's a lot of things where it's like, step one, draw a circle. Step two, draw the rest of the owl. So I like to think of my channel as one of those where it takes me half an hour to explain anything because I go over every actual little detail. Let's hope I do it that way this time. To not make the videos too long, I will now shut up and actually do the video. But also, so this is a three-parter. Video one, this one, I'm just going to show you the circuit and briefly explain what's going on on a high level, and then show you with a speaker. Video two is going to be actually explaining what's going on. We're going to go through with the Kirchhoff's laws and Ohm's laws and all that, and I'll show you what the circuit is doing in each piece. And video three is going to be the how to use it video to say, okay, here are my input parameters. Here's what I need. Here's the load I have. Now show me how to do all the math to make the circuit. Believe me, I've gone through all of this stuff. Three videos make sense. Let's get to it. So we first have our signal, our AC signal, which doesn't have to be AC power. It just means it's on both sides of the zero line. It has positive and negative components, and it varies a lot when it's not quiescent. That's generally what we mean when we say AC and DC. DC just means you've got a stable signal that varies sometimes generally logic, and AC is a signal that varies while across the zero line. So that's our signal. Next, I'm going to have a safety resistor. You don't need this if your signal already has impedance, if there's resistance coming in. For example, it comes from a previous amplifier step or whatever. Now, I'm going to use the function generator on my oscilloscope, which does have a 50 ohm output impedance, which should be enough, but it's also an expensive oscilloscope. So I'm going to throw a 330 ohm resistor on there just to be safe. The only thing that does is cut the total amplitude of my signal. It makes it quieter. So if necessary, I can always turn it up a little bit. So we have the resistor. And of course, the other end of the signal is grounded to your negative, to your zero, to your reference voltage. This is going to be common between the signal and your power supply, which is over here. All right, we just have our power supply. I guess there's no reason to actually put it up there. But remember, you need your common ground when you're communicating between different power supplies, the power supply of the generator and the power supply of the amplifier, because you're sending a signal. You're not relying just on the voltage, you're relying the voltage relative to a zero. Then we have something a little more interesting, a variable resistor. This one you do want, except in the most specific of circumstances, this is your volume knob. When this is at zero, your volume is at maximum. It is amplified as much as the thing can manage. And then you increase the resistance to turn it down and down and down. On some speakers, you may notice if you listen very closely, stick your ear right in the thing, when you have the volume down, you can still hear it. Because it's not an open circuit when you turn the volume all the way down. If you turn the thing off, it will be. But if you turn 
the volume all the way down, it's just the maximum of whatever resistor is in there. Then, things start to get more interesting. We have a capacitor. And I'm going to be using electrolytics in this circuit, just because they're larger. If you're careful, once again, it's not going to be much of a problem. So the purpose of the capacitor is to separate the signal. So it removes any bias on the input. There shouldn't be any, but just in case there is. But its primary purpose is any DC components in the amplifier will be removed. So let me bring this down over here, and we'll say that this is the input portion. So that's just the input portion of the circuit. The rest of it is going to be the actual amplifier. So at this point, we have a signal that is safely restricted if necessary, volume controlled, and separated from what's to come. So we will of course be using a transistor, a nice NPN transistor. The base to emitter junction has to be forward biased for it to be transmitting. And remember, we want the entire signal to be in the output. We don't want it clipped or cut off or anything like that. So the NPN transistor has to be on all the time. It can be choked off to near zero if that suits whatever part of the signal is coming in, but it has to be at least minimally conducting so that our wave is not distorted in any way. So we have to bias this signal up because some of it is negative. So we have to get the negative part past zero, so it's all positive, and then we have to bring it up a little bit more to make sure that the base to emitter junction is always biased. So the capacitor is going to block that bias from coming through. So the bias is going to be simple. A simple voltage divider. And of course, using our common ground. So here we have a voltage divider. The signal pops right into it, and it goes out into the transistor. So the input signal is directly controlling the base of the transistor, adjusted upward by this bias, this voltage divider right there. Now you say, I remember your last video on DC biasing. That's vulnerable to power supply noise. Don't worry, we're getting to that. So of course your power is going to go through the transistor and we need a resistor at the top. Let me move this down a bit. So there's the base connection and then through here is going to be our output signal. So first of all, you need the resistor to control the current through the transistor. You also need it to control the current through the load. One characteristic of this class A amplifier is there is noticeable output impedance. So that's definitely a downside, but you can compensate for that with the Tim Taylor solution, more power. But right now it's going to be plenty good enough. But in addition, this resistor has to be there because otherwise your output is always connected to positive. So you wouldn't actually get a voltage variance. So this has a variable voltage drop depending on the current. See the transistor is a current controlled device, so it controls the current through here, which controls the voltage drop through here and here, and then you get your output voltage and there's your signal. And then of course, the other end of the transistor is connected out. Now I'll explain this resistor later in the second video, because there is a lot going on. This is one of the most important components of the circuit. But just to briefly mention, this resistor is responsible for counteracting the noise on the power supply. This resistor is also responsible for counteracting the effects of a varying beta value. Beta is the multiplier from base current to collector current. It's the amplification of the transistor. It varies per device based on construction. It varies by temperature. It varies by current. It varies by a lot of things. It's very wiggly. So this resistor helps counteract that. So you can put in different transistors and the transistor is also stable when it's just sitting there. And finally, the resistor forms a voltage divider with the resistor up here. That determines your gain. Gain is how much increased the signal is because we're trying to amplify. We're trying to increase the amplitude of the signal. So if you had your function generator directly plugged into your speaker, you probably wouldn't be able to hear it. But if you plug the output of the amplifier into it, you would be able to hear it. So then, of course, one final capacitor is connected there. That's the output. And let's separate this again because now we're in the actual load. There's your capacitor. And then we have our load and our negative. So we just go through the capacitor, through the load, and back out to the shared ground. The purpose of this capacitor is to remove the bias once again, because we want this back down to zero. Remember our previous hacky amplifier that would always keep the speaker on one side? Without this capacitor, that's what would happen. So if you left this capacitor off, your circuit would still work, but it would go back to 
driving the speaker only to one side. The waveform would always be positive because it's always somewhere between your positive voltage and your negative voltage, which is referenced as zero. So if this was nine volts, it would be something from nine volts to zero. So we gotta bring that down to let's say minus 4.5 to 4.5 or whatever. So the capacitor just brings that bias down to zero. There's your load, there's your negative. This is the amplifier. I'm not gonna say anything more until my second video where we'll go over it. But just in summary, the characteristics of this amplifier are high fidelity. The signal is completely reproduced from there through the transistor and out without any noticeable distortion. So it's the best quality amplifier you would have on a basic level. There's fancy crap you can do, we'll get into that later, but normal simple amplifiers. And this is a real amplifier, you'll find this exact circuit all over the place. This is a real amplifier, high quality. It's also incredibly high power. You're draining current through the bias, you're draining current through the emitter. Neither of those is doing anything directly. That power is just sinking out. And you've got a lot of resistance here, so you have to have high power to overcome the resistance enough to actually drive the load. So that's a sacrifice. High fidelity, high power. Now there's one trick, one tiny trick that I'm not going to explain at all, and that's an additional capacitor right here. I'll just throw it in there real quick. We'll explain it tomorrow. Capacitor in parallel with this resistor. This resistor, this very important resistor, reduces the gain. The maximum amplitude of the output is reduced by this necessary thing. So it's something we have to live with. If you put this capacitor on here, that goes away. You get your full gain back, but you can also have distortion. If you choose the right capacitor and your circuit is powered enough, if everything's done well, the distortion will be minimal, but it's there. So this is why this capacitor is considered optional. You can have better fidelity and lower gain, or get your full gain for the same power, but risk some distortion. Don't worry about that. Let me show you, and also show your ears, the amplifier. So there's not really going to be anything to look at here, but it's better than showing you nothing. The oscilloscope, I'm only using the function generator. Suppose I can get those wires out of the way. I'm going to be doing a regular sine wave. I'm going to have it by default on three kilohertz, but we'll move that up and down within the human hearing range. And I'm going to be using a one volt peak to peak sine wave, which means it's going to be negative 500 millivolts to 500 millivolts, up and down and up and down. The power supply, is going to be set on 9 volts. In a real speaker system, that's the plug into the wall versus the audio plug from your computer. That's the two things here. The oscilloscope is going to be your audio plug, which is not supposed to draw hardly any power at all. And then the power supply in the wall is actually the meat of the amplifier. I have here a 330 ohm resistor as my safety resistor from my signal. And then I have a potentiometer, which I believe is 104, that's 100,000 ohms. So I can turn the volume up and down. In fact, I have it configured, make sure the volume is down. So now it's silent or close enough to silent with 100,000 ohm resistance. I've got 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitors, one connected to to the input. The negative end is connected to the signal because the bias is going to be on the other side. So we put the positive end towards the bias because that's going to be a higher voltage. So that should prevent the electrolytic on that side from receiving any noticeable backwards voltage. So it shouldn't explode. Another 10 microfarad on the output. The positive is towards the amplifier. Once again, that should be more positive on the positive end than the negative, so it should be safe. I'm using Various resistors throughout will go over the values when I show you how to make one in video three. Right now, we just got resistors. Your capacitor values, we'll have to go into more research of that in the future. Basically, every capacitor value has a certain frequency that it passes through the best. Its own favorite frequency, if you will. Resonant frequency, I think is the term. And then if you go higher frequency, it starts to resist a little bit. If you go lower frequency, it starts to resist a lot. So you have to increase and decrease your capacitor values until your signal comes through without distortion. So if you're trying to amplify wall AC, you're going to have very low frequency and so use different capacitors than if you're amplifying an audio signal, which is in the human hearing range, or amplifying some very high frequency data signal, analog data signal, like measuring with an oscilloscope. You would use different capacitors. And then I have a third capacitor that's currently unplugged. That's my emitter resistor bypass capacitor, which I'm just going to demonstrate and we'll explain later. I have a standard 2N3904 signal transistor, the kind of thing you'll find all over the place for very little money. And my load is going to once again be that little speaker that I took out of the spooky breaker box. It's getting some use. It is a 
0.5 watt maximum 8 ohm speaker. I'll just stick it there so at least it's on camera. So without further ado, I will turn on my power supply. Let's go ahead and limit it to 40 milliamps. And it's going to be taking roughly 12, 14-ish milliamps with my current configuration. So again, you won't be able to see. When I plug in the scope to the full circuit, the scope doesn't register it properly. Basically, I'm doing it wrong. The circuit works, I'm measuring it wrong. I need to study more on how to use the scope. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Trust me, it's just a sine wave. So I'm going to try and hold the speaker relatively close so you can hear it. And because of my volume normalizer, I'm going to have to talk while it's speakering so you can judge the relative volume between it and my voice because I'm my voice is going to be about the same level. So the volume is currently all the way down. Let's turn it all the way up. And now hopefully, if I'm doing it right, you will be able to hear that this thing is now on. This is a three kilohertz signal. I will now vary the frequency down and down. Let me talk a little quieter so you can hear it down and down and up and up and up. That was up when I said down, but this is up and up and up. So now we're about at 4,000 hertz. So let's go down past three, we'll go down past two, and it's, once you get down to two and below, it's very quiet. You can tell it gets much quieter, if you can hear it at all, hopefully you can. Now this is without that bypass capacitor. Remember I said, without the capacitor, your gain is reduced. Obviously this is quiet, but it's amplifying, you can definitely hear it. If I plugged the signal directly into this, Without the amplifier, it would be quieter still. So we are amplifying, just not that terribly much. And this speaker is rated for 0.5 watts. I'm putting through less than a tenth of that, you know, close to maybe a 20th or so of that. So the speaker's actual maximum volume is not anywhere near. Now, like I said, this is your volume control, this potentiometer. So I'll speak and it'll go down and down and up and up, all right? And similarly, if I change the amplitude of this wave, it gets louder and 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 louder. And now you can hear it pretty well. And I turned it down and down and down and down and down. I was trying to keep my volume stable there. So you can change the amplitude of the input. It'll change the amplitude of the output, but that's not what we want to do. So let me turn the frequency. Oh, let's leave it at three, but let me turn the volume down. So now it's off and I'm going to throw in my capacitor. So there is my bypass capacitor now connected. So without changing the amplitude any, it's back where it was, one volt peak to peak. I will now turn the volume back up. So you can tell it's definitely louder. I don't have to measure my volume anymore. If I turn the frequency down, you can hear it fine and up. And this is to about four kilohertz and let's not make everybody crazy. That happens to be 800 hertz. So we go down and down and down pretty low. Human hearing range goes down pretty low. You should be able to hear this, maybe. And of course the frequency response of such a crappy speaker, it doesn't have a lot of bass, but this is about 600 or so hertz. So let's go back up to, let's say 2000. Let's say 1000 right there. So that's a thousand hertz. If I change the volume, down and down and up and up. You can hear the volume changing, at least if my volume normalizer is not doing its job too well. And if I change the amplitude of the signal, make the signal bigger, it gets quite loud, quite loud indeed. And you should be able to start to hear some distortion when I get too high. I probably don't even need to speak for you to hear this, but I'll go ahead and do it anyway. So it, it's probably hard to hear. Let me turn this back down. It's probably hard to hear with all of the different audio devices and filters I have between this and you, but I was getting some distortion. And the reason for that is I have a certain amount of distance, let's say between my nine volts and the base to emitter junction. So from zero up through the bottom resistor, up through the base to emitter junction to make sure it's biased, I have this much room. And then we stick the signal zero here and it goes up and down within this range. But the more I turn it up, the closer it gets and it starts slamming against this, starts turning the transistor off or it slams against this and it clips and it won't amplify past the input voltage minus nominal resistances. To counteract that, you increase your input voltage and then you have more headroom. But anyway, we'll get into that later. Right now, you can see we have a good amplifier. We definitely can amplify it to get a plenty audible signal. So it's a real amplifier now. And I have deliberately reduced my 
possible output, voltage, and current. Because I'm just using all these basic components rather than power components, I'm limiting all of the current throughout the entire circuit to no more than a quarter of a watt at any point. There's all kinds of tricks you can do. You can use components rated for higher power dissipation, or you can use parallel and serial, for example. For example, if you have a 1,000 ohm resistor and it's dissipating too much power, then use two 500 ohm resistors in series. They'll each dissipate half the power for the same resistance. Or transistors, you can use a higher rated one, or you can actually use multiple transistors in parallel and you share the base collector and emitter connections to them, but they each split the current between them, but they're all controlled by the same knob. And it's not perfect, but it works. So even without too much power usage, because this thing is only drawing, right now, even idle, it's drawing only about 16 milliamps through my power supply, and then the signal, it's drawing minimal voltage. So we definitely could go higher. And of course, a good amplifier for a final speaker setup would have additional components. Multiple amplifiers, filters for low and high frequencies to improve bass treble tone and all that. And a couple pull-down resistors and sinks and stuff to take stray current when you turn the circuit off. Because when I just turned my current down, the speaker went... Ehh. Just like that. So you're going to want to have some extra resistors in there to dissipate that current when you turn it off so it doesn't cry in sadness for loneliness whenever you go away and stop listening to it. But in any case, in the next video I'll explain the circuit in full detail so you'll actually understand everything that's going on, including that mysterious third capacitor. And in the third video I will walk you through the process of making one. All the math, selecting your resistors and everything, and there you go. So until then, be seeing you.